many of you have experienced any sort of fear about automation and robots and sort of the end of the world being taken over by machines? Anybody actually worried about that? I'm serious. <laughs> okay. Because <laughs> there's so much media about that. So I just, what, what's your, tell us about you. You're a really interesting, very young person, which irritates me how young and smart you are. But uh, tell, tell us about you. I'm just saying it because you're going to hear hostility, and it's not because he's a bad person. It's because he's so young. Look. We were joking about that briefly backstage. Um, so my name is Idris Sandu. Um, I'm 21 years old. I um, started working at Google when I was like 13. Um, I've worked at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Uber, um, Boeing, Raytheon, Northrop Grumman, um, Snapchat, help design spectacles and stuff. Okay. See, are you irritated like now? A whole bunch Who's of <laughs> tech giants. Um, you know, but ultimately, like, I was inspired by Steve Jobs unveiling the first iPhone. Uh, it signified a very important period in uh, software development, I would say, um, where the regular consumer could develop for another consumer. Um, they opened up that bridge for there to be, like, a SDK for everybody to be able to, like, essentially develop on a platform. Got super inspired, and, you know, that, like, jump-started my career. Um, currently, uh, I consider myself an architecture both, you know, as a trade and also uh, my, as a mindset. Um, architecture, contrary to popular belief, is simply anybody that can saw, uh, take a figment of an idea and create it into an actual product. And so I'm focused on applying the concepts of architecture, product design, industrial engineering, software management development, and applying it to, fusing it with culture to essentially design for the new world. I worked at a fast food restaurant when I was his age. I'm just... <laughs> All right, <laughs> so Keith, back to you. I'd like to define automation just really clearly so everyone understands it, because we hear AI a lot. We hear robots are taking over. We hear all these things. So can you just give us a really succinct definition of automation? Sure, automation, uh, I'll give you an example of one form of automation. It's something called RPA, uh, which is robotic processing automation. And some of these kinds of things is where intelligent bots are out there and they're able to, to then uh, automate uh, practices that normally would be, uh, be manual. Uh, those things can occur inside of the legal industry, uh, inside of a financial services type of spreadsheets and things like that. So, um, you know, really what we're looking at in terms of, of AI and robotics is a future where we'll be more human machine kind of teaming. Uh, more of an interactive kind of a relationship, which is really one of the needs for uh, having folks to be upskilled so that they can have this kind of dynamic relationship. Um, on the manufacturing side, you know, Toyota, when they have some of their new engineers come in and they're working in their factories, they actually call folks you know, doctors of robots or robot doctors. And so we're going to see, as things move forward, a much more interactive kind of a relationship uh, between uh, humans and, and, and machines and humans and algorithms uh, that before we, we see presently. And we just want to make sure that folks are, are going to be ready uh, and skilled up for, for that kind of relationship. Great, and Idris, I know you had a, a sort of a take on it as well as it relates to energy. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, I'm, I'm someone that like, you know, when I was young, I loved like reading on quantum mechanics and stuff. But before I even like go into automation, I want to like explain what, you know, um, what energy is. And so energy, as most of us probably know, is the ability to do work. You know, so it could either be through physical means or a chemical process. So, you know, when, whenever we complete a task or we, we do anything, um, it's essentially using energy. It's work, right? So automation is essentially the same use of energy to complete a task without human uh, assistance, essentially. You know, we mostly use it for robotics, but it can be, through, I mean, through software and so many different things. And the interesting about automation and I, was, I gave a talk about this last week was, um, you know, uh, how many of you have heard of Moore's Law? Great. So pretty much like everybody in here. Yeah, so for, for those of you that don't know, you know, Moore's Law states that the number of transistors on a densely populated chipset, um, you know, they, do, uh, they double, you know, every two years. And that allows machinery to be more efficient, um, less, you know, uh, they consume less, they process information faster and they can be smaller. So all those things and all those factors contribute to, you know, like automation currently. So. And that's great. So 
we've been talking all day about how to leverage the talent in this community. And I know, Keith, you and I were talking about that there's some real data that supports this idea that we've got to tap into this community, especially when it comes to the world of automation. Can you share those thoughts? I thought that was a really interesting point, a different way to think about this. Yeah, well, I wear a couple different hats uh, besides uh, being the chief strategy officer for uh, the Tesla Foundation. I'm also part of a university alumni angel group that's uh, Stanford Angels and Entrepreneurs. And so, you know, we're really focused on uh, pushing forward in that ecosystem to help to support through education and, and professional development uh, how talent can be nurtured and how talent can be invested in. And so one of the things that we found uh, through some of our work up, uh, up north uh, in Palo Alto um, with one of the professors, Professor Raj Chetty, and his work in his Equality of Opportunity project, which is uh, they use some data sets looking at patents and looking at clusters of patents to try and see where innovation networks were. Um, they looked at uh, grades, age, you know, th grade three to grade four, and percentiles of math and science students. And what they really found was that uh, with the right kind of uh, access and support uh, and enrichment uh, with girls and in communities of color and, and underserved, that uh, we could quadruple innovation uh, in the United States. And so, uh, just think about that. If you quadruple anything, uh, that's a quite, a, quite a task. And so, uh, ultimately, uh, that really works to the benefit of, of, of all of us. It really lifts all the boats. Uh, it benefits government, it benefits uh, academia, and certainly it benefits industry and those that invest uh, in, in said talent. Um, there, there are a lot of folks that have ideas uh, that, that are problem solvers, and by, uh, by investing uh, in those folks, uh, we could quadruple innovation in the United States. And, and ultimately, that's not just a balance sheet issue. That's not just relative to the hubris of ROI or return on investment. If you really look at it, that's uh, not just an economic uh, engine or economic security issue. That's really a national security issue uh, for, the, for the United States. Uh, one of the um, initiatives that we're working on uh, now through uh, one of the federal departments is to really find a way to help push more, as they call, cyber patriots and cyber warriors and the cybersecurity side. Everybody's very clear on what occurred in terms of uh, quasi-Russian meddling and North Korea and things like that, but the new war is cyber war. Do we have enough people in the United States to protect the United States from that kind of foreign activity? No, we don't. So we need to uh, find that talent, said talent, and nurture that talent so that uh, not only can we create fantastic new companies, uh, but that we can uh, protect the United States so we can all have a sustainable quality of life. And I, I think that that's fascinating because often when we talk about giving diverse communities opportunities, it's about being fair. But this is more than just being fair. This is actually a strategic imperative for our country, right? Yeah, it is, you know, and, and uh, on the East Coast, there are a number of institutions that are receiving money from Homeland Security and NSA uh, just for this very purpose. Um, but it's not really kind of trickling down into other communities. Uh, you know, in May 2017, there was a presidential executive order related to cybersecurity and protecting federal networks. And strangely enough, there was a carve out for workforce development for cybersecurity. So, uh, but where is cybersecurity, you know, happening in, for girls, young women, uh, and communities of color? Um, so that, that's just one area. What we're really looking at, uh, as, a, as a think tank, a lot of our research, you know, coming from IBM or McKinsey or Boss Consulting Group or whoever else, and, and folks in our own shop, uh, you know, executives are really looking at other kinds of robust characteristics of students. Uh, not just tech training, but they're looking for things that used to be called soft skills, but are really more integral skills. And so global leaders are looking for folks that can listen well, they're looking for folks that uh, can communicate well and, and uh, collaborate well, uh, that are creative and have leadership. And so those, again, are, are some of the things that a lot of the, the entities that are in this room uh, are helping to sort of push forward uh, in our communities. That, that's kind of exciting. I wish my eight-year-old would listen better because then she could go work for you. Anyway, <laughs> that's a whole other story. But I just, you also had, uh, you were telling me that say we did lay out this world where we could access this great talent, there's still a disconnect culturally, right? Can you explain that to everybody? Yeah, I mean, my thing is like, you know, being fortunate enough, you know, 
working at some of the biggest tech companies in the world and coming back to the hood and giving a lecture at USC or UCLA or something, I realized there was always a disconnect. And, you know, I would have college students, high school students, look me in the eyes and not believe that I was able to do everything I did because how could a kid that grew up in Compton, you know, have that level of access to the information that you have? So I realized there was a disconnect. And, you know, there's something, the most, impor uh, the most important thing or the most important commodity apart from time and love and other things is information. And until the level, uh, the playing field for information is leveled, none of us are free. You know, if one of us is oppressed and we're all oppressed, none of us are free. So, you know, I look at the way information is distributed, especially in technology, and we only, especially as a culture, we only receive information on the high level. You know, with programming, you have high level and low level programming, right? You have middle level and stuff too, but you know, high level is API and stuff. You know, when you go low level, you're actually tapping into the kernel and the operating system itself. So what I'm saying is, you know, as a culture, th the majority of us only get to the point where we can focus on the application. How do we build the next mobile application? How do we create the next great service? When in reality, if you look at three of the major, the, uh, the major operating systems in the world, Microsoft, uh, Microsoft with Windows, Google with Android, and um, Apple with iOS, and Linux and others, but those are the three major operating systems. And I can say that these operating systems by default are biased because unless a piece of software is built by a diverse team from the ground up, it's automatically rendered biased. So, you know, we have this whole industry and this whole culture being trained, learn Swift, learn C Sharp, learn all these programmings that were initially built, not with the intention of being biased, but by default, they're biased. So, you know, so like what I'm trying to do is, you know, encourage people, yeah, we could focus on mobile applications, but it's like a shoestring because an application is housed where? in an app store, where it, and, and who creates that app store, another company, blah, 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 and everything goes, it trickles down. And at any given time, if Apple shut down today, that's over a billion apps in the store shutting down as well. The infrastructure, or the, uh, the information that should be conveyed to the culture, um, especially um, people of color, isn't. You know, so like my whole thing is I'm just trying to change that. I'm trying to encourage more people that we should stop just focusing on applications and we should focus on services. You know, Amazon is one of the largest cloud services in the world, you know, um, and it's, I mean, it's, it's, you know, we could go up and down and talk about diversity and stuff, but we know the truth. Um, and, so, you know, Apple, all these other companies. So, you know, I'm saying to everybody in this room, like, yeah, let's focus on applications, but if we really want to affect change and economically empower the culture, let's focus on operating systems. Let's focus on services. Uh, you, can, you, know. you can clap. Yeah, yeah. Keith, you had a point? Yeah, yeah, I'd like to add something to that, and thanks for bringing that up, because one of the things that, that is happening, you know, it's clear one of the other things that we're doing uh, in some of our activity with uh, K through 12, and we're trying to deal with the College Board right now, is well, where's the data, where's the input? Now, normally, uh, you know, if one wants to be measured or get into college, you, they look at GPA, they look at, uh, uh, you know, ACT, SAT, or other standardized tests, which have implicit bias inside of those, and, and a GPA is not really reflective of the robust characteristics of an individual but that's an old system but similarly as uh, Idris was talking about is that um, when you start talking about algorithms and you start talking about software uh, there are challenges there too and there's something that we've just touched into with uh, MIT uh, something called algorithmic accountability because uh, as he was describing, the algorithms, they are being created by individuals that have a particular bias. And right now, the way the AI and facial recognition is going, um, there's bias in facial recognition. So if you want to talk about you know, racial profiling, you know, it's going to go to a whole other level uh, because of the lack of algorithm accountability. So we need to, that's on a policy level because a lot of times folks at the policy level we're having some conversations with some people in Congress related to that. Uh, they don't know what that is. 
And so uh, it's, in, it's incumbent upon those in this room and, and those here at CNN and folks like Idris and, and ourselves to, to make sure that the policymakers uh, are able to be a part of that conversation. One of the things that we recognize is we're not trying to stifle innovation. We understand the power of inventiveness, but you've got to have this blend between policy and innovation. And this is truly a time where policy and innovation need to come together. And it's a term that uh, uh, lady in Obama's White House, uh, a bright person, uh, Lisa Elman, uh, give her credit for titling this, is polyvation. And so we really need to have some polyvation when it comes to bringing resources to the table for the culture that you just was talking about, as well as specifically for this algorithmic accountability question, which is going to continue to be really, really important as we move forward. You know, I, I mean, as a kid that was raised in L.A. all his life, um, you know, my dad was like never really around. And so, you know, I went through like so much stuff. And, you know, my dad being from Ghana, like, you know, uh, told my mom that he wanted to like take me on this two week trip to Ghana, West Africa in this village. And we go there. He abandons me there and I have to stay there for like eight months and I have to be like smuggled back to the state. It's, it's crazy. Right. Yeah. But um, as soon as I got back, Steve Jobs unveils the iPhone got super inspired. I knew it was the future because of the, of the SDK, the ability for consumers to develop for other consumers. So, you know, a kid that was in Compton, you know, I just started going to the library and I would go to the, I called it the dusty old section. It was a section that nobody wanted to go to, you know, and um, I, I like to use this, like the books were so degraded that I couldn't even check them out, you know, but I would go to this section in C sharp, you know, Python came a year after, but basic, assembly, Fortran, Commodore, like I went all the way back, you know, R, just learning all these programming languages. I didn't know where to start. I was just like, okay, I just need all the information, the information, information, because if you have the information, you win, you know? Um, and then, yeah, like I remember, I think about a year and a half in, there was this guy and I didn't know he would notice me, you know, looking through the book, coming to the library and just reading these books all the time. You know, he's like, um, uh, I'm not going to mention his name and stuff, but he's like, you know, um, I see you come in here all the time looking at, you know, C sharp books and stuff. What are you trying to do? I'm just like, you know, I just want to change the world. I don't know how, if it's going to be on a micro or macro, but I'm just so hungry to in innovate and stuff. And he's like, well, you know, I have this internship um, opportunity for you and Venice and Main Street you know, applied and like it wasn't a surge or something goofy like that, was it? <laughs> no, no. And it's so funny because I was on the initial Google Plus team, you know, so it's like real crazy. So, I mean, I, I guess like my career started at 13, I guess, you know, but yeah, that's the story for that. That's great. Um, another question? Yeah, you can clap. That's awesome. How about you, sir, in the white shirt? This is for Indris. Um, I, I'm an artist. So I'm not a programmer. I'm not a code, but I've had to teach myself that in order to create some apps. And you know what you're talking about, you know, I, I can't just create it for Apple, I gotta create it for Android also, which is something I'm dreading, you know, but I have to do that. But you're talking about services, so I'd just like you to expound them more on that because that's opening up another avenue that I'd like to explore. Yeah, you know, I have, I have some talks with my friends all the time, and I tell, um, you know, one of my good friend's daughter, I, and she's 13, I'm 21, and I tell her all the Irritating. time. You know, I, I tell her all the time, I'm not the one that's going to change the world. You are. I'm going to build the infrastructure for you to develop. Anybody under the age of, when was the last time you, heard, you watched like CNN or anything and anybody above the age of like 17 was there for developing a groundbreaking technology? They're not there yet. They're still adapting. So, you know, we have Facebook and stuff and, you know, Mark and all of them, they're like 30, Elon, they're all like 30 and you know, 40s now, you know, but the kids truly haven't developed a platform yet. So if we have a whole generation that's being instilled with, let's go to code.org and develop, and I'm no knock to code.org or anything, but let's, you know, teach this kid how to build on uh, Facebook React and so blah, blah, blah. They're essentially being programmed to build on other platforms. Then what are we doing as a culture? You know, so when I say services, it doesn't have to be exclusively. I would prefer, like, you know, a team that builds the next operating system for the culture was, like, an artist, a fashion designer. You know, it needs to be a whole, it needs to be, there needs to be diversity. How about a middle-aged broad? Is that Everybody, it needs to be diversity. <laughs> checking, you know, checking in. It's like, you know, it's at the, at the core of everything is we're one race. 
one people. It's just like I, wanna, I wanted to add on to that really quickly because uh, uh, it's nice to listen to a younger guy next to me talk about culture. By the way, Keith, you look great. Thank you okay. very much. <laughs> I, I, you I didn't want to like you know. All right. Not just about uh, Idris. <laughs> uh, culture. Just go back to culture again. I'm actually I mean, forty. There you go. Uh, you know, the culture, um, you know, spending four years up on the farm, you know, right across the street from Stanford is Palo Alto High School. So can anybody here tell me how many companies have been built uh, and grown out of Palo Alto High School in the last three or four decades? A whole lot, because it's a culture, right? You know, my mom taught for 18 years at Crenshaw High School. How many companies were built out of Crenshaw High School? Not as many as Palo Alto High School. Now, that's not relative to the talent, that's relative to the culture. It's relative to the innovation network that exists in that particular part of the world, uh, where you've got you know software, finance, VC, lawyers, uh, e educational institutions of higher learning that that drive that. So speaking of culture, you know, unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, in some respects, it was very very fascinating to sit and listen to Mr. Barnes uh, talk about his journey. You know, but sports in this country has been created a, a pipeline for one particular uh, facet. It's a farm system that's worked really well for sports. But we're here today, uh, and it's one of our uh, major initiatives, is to build a farm system for inventiveness, farm system for innovation, just like those folks are in here today. And instead of McDonald's All-American list for, for, for ball, we're going to have the Tesla list for innovators. And that's what we're talking that's about. That's here. That's great. We're talking about culture, a new culture. And the thing is, is we've had this culture inside of, uh, you know, Latin and, and African American communities, as well as young girls and women, a culture of innovating. I mean, you know, I saw my mother run a household just like everyone else's moms run a household. That is not an easy thing to do. So, you know, we have culture in these different communities, Asian Pacific, Latin, uh, African American, and et cetera, and along with you know, women and girls, a culture of innovation. And yet, in many respects, the culture that is out inside the media has pigeonholed us to do one or two things uh, based on their, their particular incentive and their profit motive. So, you know, my, my son has been recruited already for a couple of different sports. He started getting recruited at nine. They're recruiting him for his athletic talent. Are they recruiting him because he's really good at math and he likes robotics? No, they're not. So uh, we want to change that because we've got, a, we've got 13 year olds who were inspired and who, uh, as a self learner, he was adaptable and a lifelong learner, and there's plenty of us out there. We want to keep nurturing that, right, and present that culture. Uh, it's that culture that exists uh, to keep driving innovation. I just. Yeah, and I, I wanted to, I realized like I didn't finish answering your question. You know, as someone that's an artist, I feel like, you know, when it comes to this futuristic, you know, there's, there's, in my opinion, there's two operating systems that need to occur, a physical operating system and the mindset. Our mind is an operating system, you know, and we need to intertwine. It's a network, you know, so all of us need to build that network, that future culture, tap in and say, you know, this is the artist's perspective on, you know, I feel like things, because of the way things are systematically, you know, um, uh, what's the word? Um, things are just like, uh, society sets these norms, and we think that you have to think this certain way. We think that the person that... Systemic? Well, systemic. There yeah, we go. Because I'm know. older, so I have a bigger <laughs> vocabulary. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's the word I was... That's not the word, but I'll use it. <laughs> ouch. I just... Ouch. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm joking. <laughs> no, but syst uh, sy 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 uh, systematically, society sets... So society, she's like laughing at me right now. But society sets these standards on how we should think. Who's to say that the next person that builds the future operating system for the culture won't even be a developer? Virgil Abloh is the creative director of Louis Vuitton, and he's not known for fashion design. He's known for architecture. Mm. You know, I feel like we need to remove the stigma of, like, you know, people needing to be uh, decades long in a specific field to impact and change that field you know so to answer your question i feel like it's a it's about the conglomeration of a diverse team not only you know uh of color uh, but you know of mindset of skill level 
of talent, of artistry, all of that coming together to address the problem. Yeah, I agree with that. It, you know, he's talking about just things that are interdisciplinary, not to just use academic terms. That's the word. He, he I'm did, old yeah. too. That's why I got that. See what I'm but saying? Two old people know vocabulary. <laughs> I'll write um, down some words later. It's okay. <laughs> but but uh, to take the point about the, the A uh, in, in STEAM, right? because it's been very challenging for us as, a, as an institution to try and bring curriculum into K through 12 and the colleges and stuff, uh, in some respects, using STEM versus STEAM, STEM versus STEAM, and the industrial arts part of that is really, really you know, important. So if you look at you know, your iPhone, who, who sent a text message while they're still in their pajamas today? Anybody sent a text message today? How many of you still wear pajamas, by okay, the way? Yeah, okay, sorry about that. Just uh, Well, who knows, who knows the command code for that SMS, right? Well, you, no one probably, because there was an industrial artist had to create that interface, right, which is what Steve Jobs is all about. I mean, he had anthropologists, he had social scientists, he had, you know, uh, uh, illustrators, he had a host of people, and it was all about design. So it was clear that, that Apple uh, in those times was really focused in on that interdisciplinary nature of the user experience. Then I wanted to go back one, one real quick point again on terms of culture. You know, sports, uh, I wasn't supposed to go to Stanford. I was supposed to go to Dartmouth because I was part of the farm system too. I got rec recruited uh, to go play basketball at Dartmouth. And uh, that's another story about why I didn't go there. But the point is, is that there's a lot of science in sports. There's a lot of mathematics in sports. There's a lot of physics in sports. There's a lot of geometry in sports. And uh, folks are doing those things daily inside of their practice. How is that being delivered to them and described to them during said practice, hours upon hours of practicing these different sports? How are their coaches or even their teachers in their classrooms helping to sort of show them that, hey, this is just like taking, you know, OCHEM. Hey, this is just like doing your trigonometry. Hey, this is just like doing your geometry. Hey, this is, uh, you know, Newton's third law. Uh, how the topspin works on a tennis ball, right? So we're all doing, girls and communities of color, we are scientists. We're doing science every day, three, four, five, six hours a day, travel ball, high school, college, professional sports. So we already are doing that, and yet it's not being framed in that particular way, right? So we need to reframe and push this forward, put it inside of academics, put it inside of startups, so folks can continue to thrive in what they're doing already, right? The discipline that it takes to be a high-level athlete is unbelievable. Mr. Barnes and others could attest to that. A massive amount of discipline and invention and innovation. So uh, let's reframe that concept of sports and sports science so that we can continue to, uh, continue to grow. Yeah, we have to um, wrap up, but um, I would love to just, so you can share with the audience. Yeah, clap. It's nice to hear clapping. Um, can, we, you, can you guys just tell us where we can um, follow you, stalk you, learn more about what you're doing? Uh, yeah, so you can find me either through uh, Stanford Angels, uh, fly up to Palo Alto at least once or twice a month. We're doing a lot of stuff with Stanford Graduate School of Education too, so if anybody has any kids who's trying to get into Stanford, I'll put in a good word for you. Uh, and then uh, you can just find me at the Tesla Foundation, you can find me on LinkedIn, and um, you know, we're here for, uh, you know, for the journey and for uh, you know, lifelong learning and uh, helping folks uh, you know, feel, find their dreams. I just, where, where can we track you? Yeah, you can like page or telegram me at like, I'm playing, <laughs> um, I'm playing. on Instagram, um, Idris, I-D-D-R-I-S underscore Sandu, S-A-N-D-U, or you can visit my website at idrissandu.com. And I mean, because I'm a, like a, a post-millennial, like my greatest form is social media. So like DM me, whatever, like I respond to everything. So, you know, just, you'll just get it. <laughs> Great. Um, um, again, I'm Lori Schwartz. You can um, track me at TechCat, TechCat Girl. I have a, 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 like month, a weekly podcast track on me. technology trends, so I'd love to have you follow me. And let's have a big hand for our, our panelists.